Good evening, everyone. My name is Tom Everett, and on behalf of the Center for Ethics and Culture, I'd like to welcome you to the second installment of the Fall 2009 Catholic Culture Literature Series. Every fall since 2002, the Center for Ethics and Culture has sponsored this event, featuring four lectures focused on prominent figures in the Catholic literary tradition. The series sprang from the Center's desire to expose Notre Dame undergraduate students and the entire Notre Dame community to the richness of the Catholic literary heritage. In an age when names such as Chesterton, Waugh, and O'Connor have little or no meaning to many undergraduate students, even Catholic ones, we at the Center for Ethics and Culture hope to promote such writers both for the quality of their works and the uniquely Catholic dimension of their literary perspectives. In the past, the Catholic Culture Literature Series has focused on such major Catholic figures as Flannery O'Connor, G.K. Chesterton, Evelyn Waugh, Graham Greene, William Shakespeare, Walker Percy, and J.R.R. Tolkien. Last autumn, rather than highlighting a specific literary figure, the series focused on the use of satire in the works of Oscar Wilde, Hilaire Belloc, Baron Corvo, and Evelyn Waugh. This year's series, Close to Catholic, a Celebration of Kindred Spirits, features four influential and fascinating authors, none of whom were actually Catholic. Yet the writings of T.S. Eliot, Simone Weil, C.S. Lewis, and Fyodor Dostoevsky all share much in common with the Catholic theology and philosophy. With these lectures, we hope to inspire Notre Dame undergraduates to read and appreciate the work of these great non-Catholic luminaries as invaluable to their Catholic formation. Please mark your calendars for two more Tuesdays, October 6th and 13th, when Joseph Pierce and Robert Byrd will join us here to continue the discussion. Tonight's lecture will analyze the life and works of Simone Weil, a woman who may be described in a number of ways, philosopher, mystic, activist, and writer. During her short life, she was very politically active, participating in strikes to protest the labor situation in France, and also fighting in the Spanish Civil War. Her early writings were focused mostly on social and economic issues, such as labor, management, and wages. However, after having one mystical vision in which Christ appeared to her, and another in which she reached a state of religious ecstasy, her writings began to address those issues through a more spiritual lens. T.S. Eliot described her as a woman of genius, of a kind of genius akin to that of the saints. Tonight we are privileged to welcome Sister Anne Estelle, Associate Professor of Theology here at the University of Notre Dame, and the author of Saintly Mimesis, Contagion and Empathy in the Thought of René Girard, Edith Stein, and Simone Weil. She is a recipient of an NEH Fellowship and of a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship. She is the author of several books, most, re most recently, Eating Beauty, The Eucharist and the Spiritual Arts of the Middle Ages, published in 2006 a board member for the Society for the Study of Christian Spirituality. She also serves as Executive Secretary of the Colloquium on Violence and Religion. Please join me in welcoming Sister Estelle. Thank you, Tom, for that nice introduction. And thank you all for coming on this cold, rainy night. This year, 2009, marks the 100th anniversary of the birth of Simone Weil, 1909 to 1943, the extraordinary philosopher, mystic, and social activist whose writings have justly been numbered among the most original, startling, and provocative of the 20th century. They, who died young and virtually unknown at age 34, having published only a few essays and affected no apparent change for the good in the world, feared that Christ's curse, which withered the barren fig tree, would fall upon her. 
The sense of being like a barren fig tree for Christ tears my heart, she wrote to Father Perrin. If her life and writings are judged by their fruit, by their kinetic effect upon others, Christ has truly blessed, not cursed her. Or rather, as they would counter, he has blessed her by cursing her, by letting her share in his affliction. The reception history of Vey's work to date has not yet been written, nor could the complete story of her influence ever be told. Books on Vey often quote the words of people like Andre, Andre Gide, T.S. Eliot, Leslie Fielder, Gabriel Marcel, Albert Camus, Emmanuel Levinas, and Pope Paul VI, all of whom commented on her. In 2003, Notre Dame hosted a meeting of the Simone Weil Society here, a magnificent conference on the Christian Platonism of Simone Weil, the proceedings of which were edited by Jane Doring and Eric Springstead and published by the University of Notre Dame Press. During this centennial year, again, thanks in large measure to the work of Jane Doring, the University of Notre Dame will participate in the International Meeting of Weil Scholars to be held October 30th to November 2nd in Angers, France. Tonight, the Center for Ethics and Culture, in its celebration of kindred spirits, has afforded us a wonderful opportunity to give a birthday present to Simone Weil by reflecting on the meaning of her life and thought, especially in its prophetic relationship to Catholics and Catholicism. In so doing, we participate in a Catholic tradition of reception that began with Father Perrin, the 34-year-old, nearly blind Dominican priest involved in Jewish refugee work in Marseille, who became her spiritual director and friend. To him, she wrote at least six letters, the last of which, dated May 26, 1942, in which she implores him to give her writings his attention. If no one consents to take any notice of the thoughts that, though I cannot explain why, have settled in so inadequate a being as myself, they will be buried with me. If, as I believe, they contain some truth, it would be a pity. I should like you to transfer the charity which you have so generously bestowed from me to that which I bear within me and which I like to think is of far more value than myself. A charitable transference to her thoughts. Too often as they herself had feared her life, its partly acknowledged, partly denied psychological obsessions the oddness of her attire and social mannerisms, her physical clumsiness, her severe and nearly constant headaches, her inedia, and the circumstances leading to her early death in England during the war, has distracted the attention of others from her thoughts. And yet her life, taken as a whole and charitably regarded, bears witness to her thoughts and to her insistent striving to act upon those she believed to be good, to render such ideas incarnate, following through their own trajectory toward what she called a contact with reality. David McLellan observes, the characteristic of they, most often mentioned by those who knew her well, is the lack of any gap between her thought and her action. It is impossible for us, she writes in her notebooks, to think without movement. Consequently, we kill in ourselves the thoughts which we do not express by acts every time that it is possible to express them so. We must refrain from killing thoughts that are precious and good. Refrain also from bringing into the world thoughts that are vile, base, defiled by unreality. 
Picking up upon this notion of a moving thought, Thomas Nevin observes, the salient character of all Vey's writings is what we might call its kinesis, the effect of her setting herself the difficult task of thinking is that she prompts us to do the same. That has certainly been the case for me, and I know that many of our Notre Dame faculty and students would say the same. I'll never forget the impression her writing first made upon me one cold spring break back in 1993 when I sat at my desk from morning to evening, day after day, riveted by what I was reading, waiting for God, gravity, and grace. She made me think, and she compelled me to write. In subsequent articles and book chapters, I associated Vey's new sanctity with that of other holy men and women of the same terrible time period when modernity ended in Auschwitz and a different postmodern time began. To what extent have Vey's writings, precisely because of their hagiographic aura, exerted a similar kinetic effect upon the church's life and teaching, beginning with the Second Vatican Council? I would like to begin to answer that question tonight, but in order to do so, one must first return to the concrete question with which they wrestled during the last years of her young life, namely whether or not to accept baptism. She agonized over that question in her six letters to Father Perrin, written between January 19th and May 26, 1942. In her letter to a priest addressed to Father Couturier in the fall of that same year, shortly before she left New York for England, in her notebooks and in conversations with other friends and priests, including those talks in her final illness with Father René de Nero. The question casts its shadow and its light also upon the pages of her book, The Need for Roots, Prelude to a Declaration of Duties Toward Mankind, in which she was working when she collapsed, sick and exhausted in April 1943. I propose to address these materials elusively in the form of a running commentary on a single, short, enigmatic text found in your handbook, handout that is, in Nevin's words, unlike anything else they ever wrote, and to which she gave a particular importance by insisting to her mother that it be placed at the beginning of her seven books of American notebooks. She wrote it in Marseille in 1942, shortly before leaving there for the United States in flight from the Nazis. It thus corresponds chronologically to the letters written to Father Perrin. Bay's biographer, Francine Duplexis Gray, calls it a fable. Jacques Caban treats it as a poetic transcription of her mystical experience of 1938 and likens it to her three poems of metaphysical inspiration, the sea, to the stars, and the gate, all of which he suggests are literary expressions of this mystical experience. Elaine Honorat similarly terms it a prose poem, tracing Vey's spiritual journey. Nevin calls it Vey's version of a gospel episode after observing that it defies generic description it's neither memoir, nor fiction, nor allegory, nor reverie. It offers, I suggest, what they calls elsewhere a superposed reading of her own life story, a mythopoetic interpretation of it in answer to her own felt need to read her story in relation to other stories, as something timeless, classic, quasi-biblical, pertaining with a certain impersonality to others as well as to the self. A reading of order behind necessity, of God behind order. Every being cries out silently, she remarks, to be read differently. They, calls it, they herself calls, it, calls this piece a prologue, the beginning of the book, 
the book which should contain these thoughts and many others. The sheer possibility for Bay's story to be related and read in this way as a prologue for thoughts suggests its kinetic force. All hagiography possesses a kind of kinesis because it opens toward imitation, extending into the lives of its readers. Edith Vishegrad has observed that saints' lives are written in the imperative mood rather than the indicative. They compel an ethical response from their readers. Saints' lives, however, unlike this prologue, are usually written in the third person, with St. Augustine's confession standing as a model for all subsequent exceptions to that rule. In telling her story to Father Perrin and in retelling it as a kind of fable, they gave to the church a saint's life in yet another grammatical mood, demanding a double response. First, an answer to an interrogative. Second, if the answer is positive, an imperative translation of thought into action. They told Father Perrin that she had given her spiritual autobiography to him for a reason. I wanted to make it possible for you to see for yourself a concrete and certain example of implicit faith. In so doing, she posed her very life as a question. She asked, in effect, what is the church to say about a case like mine? If my vocation and that of others like me is from Christ, as I believe it to be, and it nevertheless falls outside the bounds of a church that is, that is itself called by him to be Catholic and therefore inclusive of all Christian vocations, then is it not true that, quote, Christianity is Catholic by right, but not in fact? Has the church, in short, defined itself, understood itself, read itself too narrowly, too humanly, with the result that it runs the risk of failing in its mission to proclaim Christ to the whole world? In the time that remains, I will first read Bay's prologue intertextually with you, slowly, attentively, to highlight its hagiographic power. I will then turn to assessing its kinetic effect, especially upon the church and her new understanding of herself in relation to other world religions and to the secular world. While it is generally acknowledged that Bay's writings did indeed exert a strong influence upon the Second Vatican Council, the full extent of her continuing influence direct and indirect upon the magisterium, is seldom recognized. Through a kind of charitable transference from Vey's unmoving position at the threshold of the church, the church itself may be said to have expanded in its conscious and explicit embrace of its own universality. Part 1. The Saint's Life as a Prologue for our thoughts. He entered into my room and said, Poor creature, you who understand nothing, who know nothing. They begins in Medias race, in the style of her beloved Homer, but also that of the biblical song of songs, which commences abruptly with the bride's words, Let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. To know what preceded this sudden entry, interpreted as referring to Vey's own sudden apprehension of Christ's presence, we must refer to other sources, in particular to Vey's fourth letter to Father Perrin, her spiritual autobiography. There she explains that she had been converted from a mimetic rivalry with her extremely gifted brother, Andre, and free to pursue her own longing for the genius of truth through a different route an ascetical path entailing ten years of concentrated attention through which she never consciously sought for God, but only for a contact with the reality of observable things. She wanted to read them rightly. 
As in the Song of Songs, the he in Vey's prologue is never named, but he appears to be Christ speaking to his creature. The twice-repeated word nothing recalls the nada of St. John of the Cross, the nothingness of the soul's dark night. They often refers to St. John in her later notebooks, but when Christ came down and took possession of her in the fall of 1938, they, by her own report, had never read any mystical works, had never imagined the possibility of a real contact person to person here below between a human being and God. She understood nothing of that, but she had come to understand, at least in part, her own nothingness. Come with me and I will teach you things which you do not suspect. I followed him. The invitation to discipleship here evokes Christ's calling of the apostles, even as her response in following highlights, highlights they's obedience to her intellectual vocation, her desire to learn, to understand. The following sequence in the narrative finds they in two places, a new and ugly church and a garret. Reader one. Took me into a it was new and ugly. He led me up to the altar and said, Kneel down. I said, I have not been baptized. He said, Fall on your knees before this place in love, as before the place where lies the truth. I obeyed. In this first location, May's persona is ill at ease, but obedient. She falls on her knees both in submission to her guide's command and in loving acknowledgement of the church as a repository of truth. The action of kneeling in the fable mirrors May's historical action at Assisi in 1937, where, as she writes to Father Perrin, quote, Something stronger than I was compelled me for the first time in my life to go down on my knees. The Romanesque chapel where St. Francis used to pray, which they describes as an incomparable marvel of purity, cannot be new and ugly, however. The double imaging of the church in the prologue as both like and unlike the saint's chapel seems to signal Vey's trenchant critique elsewhere of the modern church, perhaps especially, as Nevin argues, of the church of the Vichy period in France, a church self-betrayed by its nationalism and its collaboration with the Nazi occupation. Christ leads Vey's persona into the church, commanding her to kneel there, but he does not command her baptism nor does he respond in any way to her protest, I have not been baptized, except to tell her to kneel in attention, in love, before the altar. The prologue to Vey's Book of Thoughts, then, begins with a Christian vocation to which she responds immediately, in obedience, but which does not apparently include, at least not yet, a calling to sacramental baptism. Father Perrin had raised the question of Vey's baptism, knowing of her mystical encounters with Christ, her practice of Eucharistic adoration, her love for the saints, and her professed belief in the central dogmas of the faith. God, the Trinity, the Incarnation, Redemption, the Eucharist, and the teaching of the Gospels, as Vey listed them later in her last declaration before being hospitalized in 1943. In letter after letter to her spiritual director, they wrestles with the question, offering a series of reasons why she feels she must decline. I think these reasons are not all at the same level of objection. 
She mentions her own imperfection and sinfulness, her lack of love for the church as an institution, her love for and identification with the unfortunate multitude of unbelievers from whom she does not want to distance herself in love, her personal susceptibility to social influence and the church's social structure, which has drawn it into too close a conformity with earthly institutions. The scandal she experiences is what she perceives to be the church's lack of an explicit Catholicity. Her opinions concerning the non-Christian religions and concerning Israel. Her sense of a mysterious God-given vocation to remain somehow outside the church, albeit at its threshold, in order, as she says, to serve God in the Christian faith in the realm of the intelligence. Her impression that Christ himself deprives her of the actual reception of the sacraments for which she longs for a necessary reason. And the belief that she may nevertheless be saved by grace through alternative spiritual forms of baptism and communion, if not at some future time through actual sacramental reception. She never closes off that possibility. In her letter to Father Couturier, they focuses her objections almost exclusively, albeit in 30, 35 theses, on the church's stance vis-a-vis -vis non Christian religions and their own and its own Jewish and Roman roots. One can never wrestle enough with God, they observed, if one does so out of regard for the truth. And that work, which Rush Rees correctly describes as not her best book. She depicts herself as torn between her great love for the spirituality of the church, its liturgy, its saints, and her alt alienation from the dogmatic language of the Council of Trent. Distinguishing elsewhere between different levels within the soul, they held the highest to be beyond the reach of thought. The role of the intelligence, that part of us which affirms and denies and formulates opinions, is merely to submit, she writes. All that I conceive of as true is less true than those things of which I cannot conceive the truth, but which I love. In the prologue's narrative progression from the church to the garret, they suggest this submission of the intelligence to love. Reader two. <clears throat> you brought me up and made me climb up to a garret. Through the open window, one could see the whole city spread out, some wooden scaffoldings, and the river on which boats were being unloaded. The garret was empty, except for a table and two chairs. He bade me be seated. We were alone. He spoke. From time to time, someone would enter, mingle in the conversation, then leave again. Winter had gone. Spring had not yet come. The branches of the trees lay bare, without buds, in the cold air full of sunshine. The light of day would arise, shine forth in splendor, and fade away. Then the moon and the stars would enter through the window. And then once more the dawn came, the dawn would come up. At times, he would fall silent, take some bread from a cupboard, and we would share it. This bread really had the taste of bread. I, I have never found that taste again. He would pour out some wine for me, and some for himself. Wine which tasted of the sun, and of the soil upon which the city was built. At other times, we would stretch ourselves out on the floor of the garret, and sweet sleep would enfold me. Then I would wake and drink in the light of the sun. He had promised to teach me, but he did not teach me anything. We talked about all kinds of things in desultory ways, as old friends do. As old friends. The beauty and intimacy of the soul's experience with Christ in the garret is sealed with the sharing of bread and wine with times of talk and silence, company and solitude, 
protected enclosure and windows open to the world's beauty, sleeping and waking. No one familiar with Vey's autobiography will fail to think in reading these paragraphs of George Herbert's poem, Love, which Vey had memorized and recited to herself in the days and weeks after her Holy Week at the monastery in Salem. You must sit down, says Love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. It was during the recitation of this poem, which had become prayer-like for her, that Christ suddenly came down and took possession of her, allowing her to feel, quote, in the midst of her suffering, the presence of a love like that which one can read in the smile on a beloved face. He who had promised to teach her things which she did not suspect apparently teaches her nothing in the garret except the knowledge of his love for her, his friendship conveyed through his presence. I slept, but my heart was awake. Song of Songs 5.2 The times of silence and spiritual rest described in the prologue resemble Vey's contemplative moments into which he entered while praying the Our Father slowly, attentively, in Greek, in the vineyards during the summer of 1941. Quote, There is a silence, a silence which is not the absence of sound, but which is the object of a positive sensation, more positive than that of sound. Christ is present with me in person. This consolation ends abruptly for Vey's persona in the prologue when Christ unexpectedly commands her, Now go! Reader 3. One day he said to me, Now go. I fell down before him. I clasped his knees. I implored him not to drive me away. But he threw me out on the stairs. I went down unconscious of anything, my heart as it were in shreds. I wandered along the streets. Then I realized that I had no idea where this house lay. I have never tried to find it again. I understood that he had come for me by mistake. My place is not in that garret. It can be anywhere, in a prison cell, in one of those middle-class drawing rooms full of knickknacks and red plush, in the waiting room of a station, anywhere except in that garret. Thomas Nevin calls Vey's Christ here a cad and a bully. Observing that this curious story is ammunition for those who presume they was masochistic. For they, however, the roughness is a proof of divine love, which, free, which seeks to free her from any idolatry of attachment or of illusion here below, lest she mistake to earthly a patria for the heavenly one. Bay's eye assumes the posture of a Greek suppliant who pleads for mercy with a knee clasp but who learns to recognize God's mercy in the very experience of rejection, in the power to love even then. Vey's last thoughts, her final letter to Father Perrin, assures him that she has been touched by experience. She has touched by experience the richness of God's mercy, which, however, quote, is manifest in affliction as in joy. If still persevering in our love as we fall to the point where the soul cannot keep back the cry, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? If we remain at this point without ceasing to love, we end by touching something, not of the senses, common to joy and sorrow alike, the very love of God. The fourth evidence of divine love here below writes they in Gravity and Grace, is the complete absence of mercy here below. Bay's eye wanders heart-torn through the streets like the forsaken bride of the Song of Songs, who walks by night through the, down the pavements, sick with love, and who is wounded there, her mantle torn by the sentinels. Experiencing the absence of Christ, he is not there, Vey's persona in the prologue is drawn into a terrible, purifying contact 
with what they, in gravity and grace, call the silence of God, who does not answer the cry of suffering, the why of affliction. Why not? Faye explains, If I thought that God sent me suffering by an act of his will and for my good, I should think that I was something, and I would miss the chief use of suffering, which is to teach me that I'm nothing. It is therefore necessary to avoid all such thoughts, but it is necessary to love God through the suffering. In avoidance of the thought that God had singled her out for his special election, a thought that would feed the ego, Vey's persona declares, I understood that he had come for me by mistake. The prologue thus echoes Vey's word in her fourth letter to Father Perrin. Quote, if one could imagine any possibility of error in God, I should think that it had all happened to me by mistake. But perhaps God likes to use castaway objects, waste, rejects. Reader 4. Sometimes I cannot help trying, fearfully and remorsefully, to repeat to myself a part of what he said to me. How am I to know if I remember rightly? He is not there to tell me. I know well that he does not love me. How could he love me? And yet deep down within me, something, a particle of myself, cannot help thinking, with fear and trembling, that perhaps, in spite of all, he loves me. Exiled from the garret and from the consoling Christ presence it symbolizes, Bay's persona is mysteriously likened to Christ himself, who in the Pauline hymn of Philippians 2, a text of key importance to Bay's notion of decreation, is said to have taken the form of a slave, becoming obedient to death, even to death on a cross. Vey's prologue thus gives imagistic expression to what Nevin calls the Christian paradox of being chosen and outcast. The he loves me not, he loves me ending of the prologue bears witness to a miracle. The afflicted soul's ability to think, at least in a deep particle of herself, that she is beloved by God in spite of all. Out of that thought, she can love in return. As Vey writes elsewhere, I must love with that part of the soul which is on the other side of the curtain. For the part of the soul which is perceptible to consciousness cannot love nothingness. Poor creature, poor creature, you who understand nothing, who know nothing. The poverty and abandonment of the end of the prologue the spirals back to the beginning, suggesting a kind of stasis, awaiting at attention, desirous, until he comes again. I should betray the truth, they insist to Father Perrin, if I left this point where I had been since my birth, at the intersection of Christianity and everything that is not Christianity. I have always remained at this exact point, on the threshold of the church, without moving, quite still. Only now my heart has been transported forever into the Blessed Sacrament exposed on the altar. Part 2. The Kinetic Effect of Saintly Stasis from Hagiography to Ecclesiology. Vase stasis, even unto death, was moving for the church. Pope John the Twenty Third's biographer records that while Cardinal Roncalli, the future Pope, was nuncio in Paris, he wrote to her father with the idea of visiting the austere room. It had a sleeping bag but no bed where she used to work. He read her short text on supernatural knowledge and greatly admired it. He was moved by her final note, which begins, I believe in God, the Trinity, the Incarnation, Redemption, 
the Eucharist, and the Gospel, but then goes on to explain why she must remain on the threshold of the Church. Roncalli treasured this text and gave a copy of it to Cardinal Augustine Bea before it was published in Italian translation in 1962. At the inauguration of Vatican Council II, Pope John XXIII pointed to Bay as an important influence upon him personally. His successor, Paul VI, named Simon Bay along with Pascal and Bernanos, one of the three most important figures in his intellectual development. The Simon Bay link between John XXIII and Cardinal Bea, and later between Paul VI and Bea, is important because Cardinal Bea was commissioned to oversee the drafting of the conciliar, conciliar document that came to be entitled Nostra Etate in Our Times, the Declaration on the Relationship of the Church to Non-Christian Religions. As Jesuit scholar Robert Graham notes, the history of that document includes, quote, perhaps the most dramatic story of the Council, unquote. The end result, overwhelmingly approved by the Council Fathers, is said to be, quote, one of the most important advances of the Council, unquote. Its promulgation marks, quote, the first time an ecumenical council has expressed such an open approach to the other great religions of the world, unquote. Giving deeper thought to her relationship with non-Christian religions, the Catholic Church in Nostra Aetate proclaims that it, quote, rejects nothing which is true and holy in these religions, which, though differing in many particulars from what she holds and sets forth, nevertheless often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all men, unquote. In so doing, it does what they had longed for the Church to do. Quote, we are living at times that have no precedent, and in our present situation, Christian universality, which could formerly be implicit, has to be fully explicit. The document goes on to point respectively, respectfully to what the Church admires in individual religions. I'm quoting. In Hinduism, men contemplate the divine mystery. Buddhism acknowledges the radical insufficiency of this shifting world. The Muslims adore one God, living and enduring, merciful and all-powerful. They would say that the document reflects a turning, an attentive looking at these and other religions, a turning of the gaze seemingly away from Christ in order to discover him also elsewhere. Most famously, perhaps, Nostra Aetate affirms the Church's own essential rootedness in Judaism and the spiritual patrimony common to Jews, Christians and Jews, and it repudiates the charge of deicide. One wonders what Simone Weil would have thought about the Church's stance, since her benighted opinion about Israel was arguably the chief obstacle barring her way toward Christian baptism. A self-hating, self-exiled, catastrophe Jew, they never turned her look of loving attention toward Judaism, which remained her tragic blind spot. Had she done so, she would have come to a deeper understanding both of herself and of Christianity. Perhaps in Bay's anti-Judaism, the Council Fathers saw yet another proof among the countless proofs of the Shoah, the Holocaust, that they needed to state outright as they did in Nostra Aetate, quote, that what happened in Christ's passion cannot be blamed upon all the Jews then living, nor upon the Jews of today, nor should Jews be presented as repudiated or cursed by God, unquote. Pope John XXIII had instructed the council not to engage in condemnation in its documents. Was he perhaps remembering Vey's critique about the use of um, anathema seat at the Council of Trent. But the Council could not refrain from using the word reprobat to express its repudiation of 
all persecutions against any man, but especially those hateful displays of anti-Semitism directed against the Jews at any time and from any source. The Second Vatican Council had, of course, multiple influences, and I do not want to overstate the importance of Bay's contribution to the thought of the fathers. But it is tempting to see Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the church, through a Baelian lens as an answer in part to her call for a truly incarnate, truly Catholic church, aware of its place and mission in the world. In the first paragraph of the first chapter of that document, we read, By her relationship with Christ, the church is a sacrament of intimate union with God and of the unity of all mankind. That is, she is a sign and instrument of such union and unity. Through her work, the document continues, whatever good is in the minds and hearts of men, whatever good lies latent in the religious practices and cultures of diverse peoples, is not only saved from destruction, but also healed, ennobled, and perfected unto the glory of God, the confusion of the devil, and the happiness of man. Famously issuing a universal call to holiness in its fifth chapter, a holiness for every walk and state of life, Lumen Gentium resonates with Vey's urgent language concerning the saintliness demanded by the present moment. The papacies of Pope, John, of Pope Paul VI and Pope John Paul II were carried out in the spirit of Vatican Council II and devoted to the translation of its thought into action. Pope Benedict XVI, also present in his youth at that council, quotes they in his repeated reflections upon secularism, and it's hard to imagine that her need for roots is not in the background of his off-quoted remarks on the Hellenistic roots of Christianity as a religion of rationality, of the Logos, and echoed also in his insistence that the Christian roots of Europe must be acknowledged and protected by the European Union. Reading Pope Benedict's comments on the crucial role of philosophy in interreligious contact and on the circularity between theology and philosophy potentially illumines Vey's own philosophical reading of Greek and Hindu myths in relation to the Christian scriptures. Among the many signs of her indirect influence upon the papacy of Pope John, the, John Paul, so rich in its interreligious dialogue and cultural exchange, one might point to the paragraphs in the Catechism of the Catholic Church on baptism. Citing John 3, 5, the paragraph on the necessity of baptism for salvation affirms that, that, affirms that necessity, quote, for those to whom the gospel has been proclaimed and who have had the possibility of asking for the sacrament, unquote. They, however, maintained that it was never a possibility for her to do so during her earthly life, save in disobedience to Christ. Was baptism then necessary for her for salvation? The paragraph in the Catechism ends with an, an amazing sentence in italics that affirms the mysterious possibility sensed by they and long acknowledged by the Church, albeit more often implicitly than explicitly, of other means of salvation, of grace, none of them outside of the church, if the church is understood broadly and deeply in the fullness of its Christian mystery. The sentence reads, God has bound salvation to the sacrament of baptism, but he himself is not bound by his sacraments. We return then to the concrete question with which we began. The question of Vey's baptism and its relevance to the related question of Vey's Catholicity. Was Simon Vey in the end Catholic or only close to Catholic, separated from the church by a non traversable distance? If Vey has taught us anything, it is that love, longing, and looking can cross even an infinite distance. I have argued that Vey's loving stasis at the threshold of the church, and in, she believed, its service. Paradoxically moved it, set it into motion 
to cross that distance. If so, then there was a fulfillment to Vey's own prophecy to Father Perrin when she wrote, If one day it comes about that I love God enough to deserve the grace of baptism, I will, I will receive this grace on that very day, infallibly, in the form God wills, either by means of baptism in the strict sense of the word or in some other manner. Thank you. union when I'm having these um, she, uh, when I'm experiencing the presence of God um, the strongest 
as well as at other moments. You know, so it's not it's not something. Um, so she's trying, trying to work it out, so there, she's definitely trying to discern it. But then the question of um, submission to um, the church's uh, dogmatic teaching, you know, why should she be an exception to what is a general rule, and what she acknowledges to be a general rule, right? I mean, it's, it's not something that she didn't, didn't ask herself. Um, and, and I wonder sometimes, because she says in her letter, um, I... I I only I, I withheld a part of my intel intelligence. Is that you know she knows that love should that intelligence should submit to love, right? And, but she said I withheld a bit of my intelligence, even though I had experienced God's love. Um, later on, she seems to have, to think that she has that God wants her to use her intelligence, you know, to, to keep wrestling with these issues that she has. Precisely so that she can bring them to the fore, express them, ask her questions. Um, and so, I, I, some people have said that, in, that, that compared her to Pascal, and said that Pascal was ready to submit his intelligence to his love, um, whereas they, in a way, sort of submitted her love to her intelligence. But she always held an intention. It was like once I never really went out, and so there she is in her deathbed, still, you know, still asking the question. And and she often formulated it: Would the church refuse me baptism, All right. knowing who I am, knowing what I think? All right. That's often the way she expressed um, her questions. Yes, Martha. Could you say a little bit more about the how her death was was Father Perry? There, or, or what were the circumstances there? It was, the final yeah, it was a, a very, very lonely death in many ways. And she was working for the Free French um, in London when she collapsed in April. Um, her friend found her unconscious on the floor. Uh, uh, she was then hospitalized and went to Middlesex. Okay, so that's, she was in, in a uh, kind of a, she, she had tuberculosis um, and was very malnourished. And so she was in a sanatorium in Middlesex when she died. Um, and, but she asked to see the, the priest, and he came, I think, once a week. You know, it was more than one visit. Um, and he, he wrote down his memories of her. He said, I have the impression that I am in the presence of a, a mature, very pure, very generous soul, who precisely because of that, you know, is laboring, you know, under... Um, under a special cross. I mean, he, he, he could not, you didn't know, it was a mystery to him too. Right? Um, but very impressed with her. You know, and I, um, not only was Sue Ellen Bay close to Catholics, she was close to lots of non-Catholics yeah. too. And I'm sort of curious if you would comment, in the world of British philosophy, say, in the 1940s and 50s, there were lots of people like Iris Murdoch and Peter Wench, especially philosophers influenced mm -hmm. by Wittgenstein, who were very taken by Simone Weil, but they had not, one would say, a religious bone in their body, mm -hmm. certainly not a Catholic bone. Can you, can you comment about how someone could have had such an enormous impact, as you suggest, on Catholic thought leading up through the Council, and also had become such a hero for this staunch <coughs> secular part kind of European intellectual life, especially at, at mid-century and continuing, becoming a kind of secular feminist hero for some people, a kind of stoic, kind of a hero of holding out against the meaninglessness of modern life. That there's no, and her refusing to be baptized comes to be, a, for some, a kind of sign of her willing to give in to the weakness of religious belief. So you you know all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on how one of the most extraordinary things about her, it seems to me, is that she could have had such different impacts on so many different people when she wrote so little, as mm -hmm. it were, and lived such a short time. Mm -hmm. Some people explain it um, in terms of the publication history, all right, so that the, the first works that were published um, were the letters to Father Perrin and some essays that she'd written for him, um, beautiful pieces of meditation on the Our Father, uh, an essay on the forms of the implicit love of God, um, and and he 
um, he added, he also acted as an editor, so he left out some things that would have maybe been a little bit more troubling to people. Um, and, and so when that was published, that was the Simo Bay that people knew. And Gravity and Grace, uh, was selections from her notebooks, um, from the vineyards of Italy where she was um, working, and, um, and those are, uh, all were similarly selected uh, by her friend Gustave Thibon, who um, greatly admired her, her spirituality, all right, and he, you know, from the point of view of that friend, that was Simone, right? And so those two books came out first, and then it was kind of a process, a gradual process of the discovery of all that she had written, and, um, and when it became known to a wider public that she had these acute um, political analyses of, um, of violence, um, of the way groups function in relationship to one another, um, then you know you started to see her in a kind of a different way. Somebody very engaged in the world, you know, and not and not just someone sort of detached from the world, right? but someone really with with her feet on the ground who's been working in in, fa in a factory, who's been working uh, with uh, the Catholic youth movement and the and the uh, sin, I don't know how to say this is a syndicalist. Um, in France, uh, who um, were trying to revive a kind of a medieval guild situation, you know, where, where the dignity of human labor, if people would have connection to their products. Um, so there were there were this many faces of Simona that they kept kind of emerging as different pieces of hers were published. Um, now, I think by the time Vatican Council occurred. Uh, pretty much all of that material, it was, it was at least a great deal of it, um, would have been would have been known. Um, and and you know, and then also it depends on you know you mentioned um, uh, British philosophers, right? But it, it, at least in in certain circles in France, I mean, she was well known, right? but small circles like you know she had a showdown conversation with Leon Trotsky, right? Um, Albert Camus knew her. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir knew her. All right, um, they didn't get along. <laughs> uh, but um, so she, you know, and who knows during all those troubled times how how connected people were. Right, um, George Bataille, you know, knew her. So you know, there's ways in these philosophical circles for uh, news to travel. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I guess I have sort of an uneasiness, uh, and maybe even sort of this thought, or sort of show that it's this guy of uneasiness. And um, I guess it's because, actually, I know nothing about Simone Bale uh, until the time. And uh, so on one hand, it seems like she progressed closer and closer to this kind of, to Christ. And on the other hand, but yet she, um, in, the, in the end, didn't. Um, well, she's she not she she was okay. Uh, okay. 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 And I, I, sorry. I feel like there's sort of if, if you're Catholic and you think the church is is uh, the Church of Christ, and it seemed like she almost thought that Christ was telling her not to. Or I, I, I think I, I'm not sure if I understood you right mm -hmm. that part. Yeah. That's what I thought. And then I'm, I have this kind of I don't know. I, I feel kind of uneasy about how to really. View that because on one hand her spirituality would seem quite beautiful, but then it didn't go towards that direction. So I'm not sure yeah. how that's supposed to. How you should think about it if you're Catholic. Well, you know, it, it, she does make you uneasy, right? She does make you uneasy, um, and I think Vatican II was, you know, the Church working hard to think about it, right? to think about her case, to think about the questions that her life raised and that she expressed in her writings. Um, and the and she never she never presented herself um, as an example for others to follow in this respect. Right? And this was her a very what she had understood to be her very personal, difficult vocation. She wasn't. Um, she of course knew that there were others, um, and she who um, through historical circumstances, through their situation in the world, to the tradition into which they were born, etc., um, may also not have the vocation to become Roman Catholic. Right? She understood that, and she talks it as a discussion about 
um, what would be the conditions that would, um, that would justify conversion from one religious system into another. And she says, if you, know, if you find yourself in a, re in a religion that's inadequate to truth, um, or then, then she said you should convert. All right? Or if you, um, you know, and she was all in favor of infant baptism. She wanted her brother's baby to be baptized. Um, but she emphasized that there's something about, and I think in this way she's very Thomist, that there, there's a connection between nature and grace. And you have to respect somehow that nature part. All right? So if you're, um, if you're brought up in a culture that has not been, uh, where there is a Christian context, it has a, a kind of Christian coloring, and, and that Christian context um, coloring can work to bring out the best and the beautiful and somehow fulfill your own culture. That culture, in a way, uh, you, can, you can still sort of belong there all right, and, and know Christ. And, and Pope John, John Paul XXIII comes close to saying that, actually, um, in his um, Threshold of Hope book, you know, where, he, where somebody raised him the question, raised him the question, Okay, well, the Father, we're at a point now for the first time in history when the Muslims outnumber the Christians. You know, we're, we're slightly under. All right, does that mean uh, Christianity is, is failing in its mission to the world? And, and the Holy Father said, well, you can't go by numbers, number one. Um, but then you also have to think about the long history of the development of the, of the world religions. Christianity is, the church is a sacrament in the world. It, 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 Every, everyone who looks at the church, all right, uh, who attends to it, is going to, and who respects it in some way, is going to be um, somehow in receiving a grace. So that all, this, all the world religions, because simply by living in the world, all right, with the church, with Christianity over all these years, have been affected. So they are more Christian now than they were, you know, long ago. All right? So there's a kind of a Christianization of, of all the religions. Um, and I think Simo Bay would agree with that, because for her, Christ, it's Christ who was there from the beginning, for the creation of the world, through whom all things were created. All right, Christ is there. All right, Christ is there present. Um, so I don't think I probably answered, answered your question or solved your unease, but um, she's, she's a, almost a thought experiment. <laughs> Yes. I'm very struck by the fact that she used to go to Christian meditation. Mm -hmm. She had this case where I belong in her sorrow that she couldn't um, take part in any type of religion and clearly leave the work of confession. Because she obviously had a sense of the reality of the sacrament. Yeah. The truthfulness of that reality. Yes. Um, she, she speaks of the sacraments in the plural when she talks about um, how. Um, of her longing for the, to receive the sacraments, uh, but her sense that somehow Christ has asked her for this special uh, deprivation of them, all right? so that she could hunger for them all the more. So as if almost the longing of the whole world, unacknowledged, could somehow be sort of challenged, a uh, channel you know, through her longing. In her notebooks, I found a reference to confession, and she she talks very positively about the church's understanding of confession. Um, and, and how that sacrament um, well, can, can free the soul right, from, from sin and evil. Um, and, and, of course, baptism is the same. So I found references to those three sacraments. Yes? Hi, I, I was just, I'm, I'm also I'm totally unfamiliar with the uh, line, but um, what, the question I had was, uh, what, what do you think, or are you aware of her position or her thoughts about uh, evangelism in particular? Uh, you suggested that uh, she wanted her nephew to be baptized, um, and as well, I'm wondering whether her position or her, or her decision in the end was, uh, not to be baptized was almost a conscious choice to sort of be able to um, communicate a truth about Christianity to um, unbaptized people or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's very well put. 
gosh, I think this very young foot. And she felt she had a mission to be a kind of a bridge, um, the, um, a bridge for unbelievers and the church. Right? That, that somehow her longing, which she, which she had to renounce the fulfillment of, um, would be a means of evangelization. And sometimes people marvel at it that she spent all, all her energy to, in the service of the church trying to, to, to get Europe to realize that it has to recognize its Christian Christian roots. And, and, that, um, and without Christianity uh, as a basis for education and culture uh, in Europe, the things would go terribly awry. Um, but even more specifically about evangelism in particular, uh, because of the, the thought that she wanted her nephew to be baptized you know, strikes me very much. Yeah. Uh, I don't know anything about her, but you know, that yeah. strikes me. Yeah. Well, you know, her, her brother Andre had come also, you know, with the whole family um, as emigres, you know, um, flying, fleeing from, from the Nazis. He had married a, a Christian woman. Um, they were in the United States, right? And so again, she's very consistent, thinking that, you know, there's a kind of, if the child is baptized, then, then she'll grow, the child will grow up in a faith, all right? It will have roots. And that, and she says that if you do not baptize the child, um, later on the, the child will feel a deprivation because it, it, does, it doesn't have those roots out of which it can grow. Yes. Um, I, just, I had a quick question. Um, you said that she said that she would help. <coughs> she said that she would help a part of her in her life. Yeah. Now, when she said this, did she say that she wanted her to do this, or this is something that she wanted to do on her own? Because I think it seems to me like an important part of the relationship is that people not being in this Yeah. And this could be um, maybe like a moment of so, but is, does she say that she sensed it? That she thought that Christ wanted her to do this, or this is something she did on her own? This is a, you know, an evolving thing, right? So that you know, when, when you look at her letters and sequence of how the parents, she gives different reasons in every letter. You know, so she, she's really thinking this through. And, and it's in her spiritual autobiography that she mentions that when she had this first experience of Christ, and the, and the experience of the love was so great, all right, and then she said, but, but still I, I withheld a little bit of my intelligence, right, and you don't know quite how to take it, because then later on she says the intelligence should submit to, to, to love, to that higher power which is beyond all knowing, right. Um, she has interesting discussions about dogma, you know, she says the dogma, the dogmas of the church um, should be loved, respected, studied, because they're beautiful. She wanted the church's dogmatic teaching to be taught in public schools in France, right? Um, and they're beautiful. But she said a dogmatic uh, ex formulation um, of the truths of the faith is always going to be a kind of repository for the truth, a truth that you can't express in words, right? That, that somehow is always going to be the expression is always going to be a little bit in inadequate, you know, to the truth that it conveys. Um, and so, but, but she was all for, you know, um, dogmatic uh, instruction, and, and she ins uh, herself was ready to affirm dogmas. Right? Well, thank you all for coming, and please join me again in thanking Sister Estelle.